Well, the second letter for us to consider from the book of Revelation is the letter to the church at Smyrna. Now, what does Smyrna mean? Smyrna actually means myrrh, and I think some of you are familiar with myrrh. Uh, the Christmas story and the three wise men, they brought frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Myrrh was an ointment. It was used to be placed upon uh, dead bodies and in preparation for uh, Jesus' death and being placed into the tomb, uh, myrrh would have been placed upon his body. So it's an appropriate name for a city whose church members are under persecution and suffering. Of the seven cities that originally received letters, Smyrna is the only one that still exists in the exact spot where it was then, but its name today is Izmir, I-Z-M-I. Are. Now, as with uh, the other letters, this letter begins with a portrait of Christ. These are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. It's actually a repeat of a uh, sentence that was uttered in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Now, think of what that portrait of Christ would convey to a church under persecution and suffering. It seems to offer hope. And it seems to offer inspiration for faithfulness. Think about it. First it says the first and the last, meaning that Christ has always been. He is always present. He's ever present. No matter where we are, you will never find a circumstance or a happenstance or a situation in which Christ is not present with you. He is sovereign. He is over all things and controls all things. He is with us both in the good times and in the difficult times of life. And second, he was dead and he came to life. In other words, Christ has been where some of us are going, maybe all of us are going, and where some of our people are today. For Christ died. And he knows what it's like to die a violent death. He died as a man. He died at the hands of men, and he has come back to life again. As one who has bore the bitter pains of hell, both in life and especially on the cross, in having died and then being raised, Christ can sympathize with his people in their distress. Christ, therefore, assured the Christians in Smyrna that they were not alone. Their hope of a better life is found in the fact that Christ not only died, but he was resurrected. He rose to new life. Now, it is at hard first for any of us in this room to imagine that this church is afflicted and impoverished, especially when I tell you what a beautiful place Smyrna was in the first century. In the first century, Smyrna was considered the most beautiful city in the entire region. The Aegean Sea was located immediately to the west, and from its shores arose Mount Pagus, on which Smyrna was situated. Its streets were so beautifully paved that one of the streets was actually called the Street of Gold. And this may be what John had in mind later in Revelation when he wrote that the streets of the New Jerusalem were pure gold. The pleasant breeze that ascended Mount Pagus. Oh, it was probably better than the air conditioning that we enjoy in Arizona today. It came up from the Gulf during the summer and provided year-long comfort to the city's inhabitants. Now, in addition to its beauty, Smyrna was known for its culture several temples, an athletic stadium, a library, and the largest public theater in Asia Minor. Those were among the places of interest, available to a population of somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people. Um, there's not an accurate account. Smyrna's temples are of special interest to those who study the book of Revelation. Interestingly, one of Smyrna's Myriad of temples was dedicated, and you can say this name in so many different ways, Dionysus. Do you know Dionysus? I think there are some people in Sun City West that do know Dionysus, and they meet up with him over in the Fries on Johnson. Dionysus is the god of wine. 
And he delivers people from the madness of the present world. You know how? By intoxication. By intoxication. He also claimed to have been resurrected. Of course, both of those two claims were fictitious and therefore offered no real consolation to those who worshipped him. People just went to that temple to have a good time. But it does show how the devil tries to deceive us of the truth of God with lies that resemble the truth. In other words, and I'm going to be quite blunt, alcohol does not solve our problems. Okay, Alcohol does not solve our problems. There was another temple there in Smyrna dedicated to the Dia Roma, the god of Rome. It had been built in around 195 B.C., making Smyrna one of the earliest centers of the Roman cult in Asia Minor. Another temple was later built to honor Emperor Tiberius, and there were many temples to many of the different emperors of Rome. Smyrna, you see, became the capital of the Roman military. Many soldiers hung out there. Most of the Roman equipment was kept there. And the interesting thing is that today, Izmir is a land headquarters for NATO. See, all in all, the people of Smyrna had an exceptional devotion to government, to the Roman state religion. They despised any whom they suspected of disloyalty to the state, especially to the Roman Empire. Bow to the emperor. Get down on your knees in front of Caesar. Praise the emperor. Worship the emperor or die. Suddenly you see... Now, this made the church of Smyrna especially vulnerable to persecution and suffering on account of their loyalty to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, although we know a good bit about the ancient city, the church that was established there has been all but forgotten. Paul probably discovered it during his uh, third missionary journey, sometime around 54, 55, 56 A.D. It's likely that he was headquartering in Ephesus, and he would go out and visit uh, different parts of the region uh, during the two and a half years that he spent there on that third missionary journey. In verse 9, the Lord Jesus took note of three things, and I don't know if you picked up about them concerning the church at Smyrna. He said, these three things accounted for the suffering and persecution of the church. He said, I know thy works. Now, those four words are found in every, um, every letter, and they usually refer to commendation. So I know your works. I know they're really good, especially when it comes to evangelism. I know your tribulation, and I know your poverty. See, these three things are connected. And you say, how so? Well, the church's tribulation and its poverty are the direct results of its works of faith. The Lord is not complaining here. The Lord is actually commending this church. In spite of what others have done to persecute this church, to mock this church, to laugh at this church, the Christians at Smyrna have remained faithful. Have you ever, and I ask you, have you ever been persecuted for your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever suffered for your faith in Jesus Christ? I mean, I know a young woman who was not a Christian. Her husband was. She became a Christian. Uh, On their marriage day, their wedding day, her family refused to come to the wedding because she had become a Christian. That's somewhat suffering and persecution and giving up your family life. I know of another young lady who was working for a business where the, the business people that ran the company were Christians and they were helping her because she had become a Christian and when she did, her family disowned her. And so she had to start from scratch. Now, some of you have told me that you cannot share Christ with your friends or with your acquaintances because you're afraid that you might lose that friendship. Some say they won't talk about Christ in some circles because of how they might be laughed at or mocked for their faith. Ah, Persecutions can be on different levels because I'm going to tell you, the church in Smyrna, they faced imprisonment. They faced losing their job. They faced even dying for their faith. But think about it this morning. You awoke on this beautiful morning in Arizona. 
You drove the church without any real threat on your life or well-being. You are enjoying a beautiful morning of worship. Boy, has the music been great. Most American Christians, like you and like me, find it difficult to even relate to real suffering and persecution for our Christian faith. But it was happening in Smyrna, in John's day, and it's happening today. In fact, I'll even ask you a question. What is the most persecuted religion today? Would it surprise you if I said Christianity? Because it is. One third, one third of the world suffers from religious persecution, and Christians are the most persecuted of religious groups, and in some parts of the world are actually beginning to disappear. These are among the grim conclusions of a report commissioned by British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt on the extent of global anti-Christian persecution, and the report came out May 6th of this year. The Anglican Bishop of Truro, the Right Reverend Philip Mount Stephen, who conducted the independent review at the request of the government, found that, and I quote, Evidence shows not only the geographic spread of anti-Christian persecution, but also its increasing severity. In some regions, the level and nature of persecution is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide according to that adopted by the United Nations, unquote. See, drawing on research by Pew, Re Pew Research Group, by nonprofits like Aid to the Church in Need and Open Doors, the report found that, and I quote, the eradication of Christians and other minorities on pain of the sword or other violent means was revealed to be the specific and stated objectives of extremist groups in Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Northeast Nigeria, the Philippines, and the list goes on and on and on, unquote. Evidence of a dwindling Christian presence is most evident where? In the Middle East, where the report noted that Christianity is in danger of being wiped out in the region where its roots go back the furthest. In Palestine, Christian numbers are below 1.5% of the population. In Syria, the Christian population has declined from 1.7 million eight years ago in 2011 to less than 450,000 today. In Iraq, Christian numbers have slumped from 1.5 million before 2003 to only 120,000 today. Christianity is at risk of disappearing, representing a major setback for plurality in the Middle Eastern part of the world. Anti-Christian persecution is global, however, in its reach. In the past year, there have been bombings in churches in Egypt, Pakistan, and Indonesia. State militaries have attacked minority Christian communities in Myanmar and the Sudan. The torture of Christians in North Korean prisons and the beatings of Christians in police custody in India. Social persecution and lack of freedom of religion in North Korea, Saudi Arabia, the Maldives, and China. Blasphemy legislation in Pakistan, Indonesia, and Iran. And I'm not even through the first tenth of the page of that report. Given the scale of persecution of Christians today, the report goes on, indicates that it's getting worse and that its impacts involve the decimation of some of the faith group's oldest and most enduring communities. The need for governments to give increasing priority and specific targeted support to this faith community is not only necessary, but becoming increasingly urgent, unquote. Now, that's just one report. I've gone to others, and others says... 82% of all people killed from religious persecution were Christians. See, Christian persecution leading to suffering and even death is a reality today, but I wonder if you even think about it. It's very difficult for us to understand. We have to stretch ourselves. We have to push ourselves, especially for someone like me. I'm not much of a world seer. I haven't been out of the United States. And yet, Christian persecution in the world today is not on, on the decline, it's on the incline. <laughs> Admittedly, I find that hard to fathom in my comfortable church, in my surroundings, in desert palms. Being a Christian in the world today is not as cozy as we have it. If you can attend a church service without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, 
you are fortunate because more than 245 million Christians today cannot. In Smyrna, Christians were losing their jobs, their freedom. They were being put in prison. Their lives, they were being put to death because they wouldn't worship Roman Caesars and emperors as God. Taxes specified just against Christians were levied against them by the state on account of their faith. Taking people's money and property is also often a very effective way of controlling people's behavior and to getting them to conform. Poverty encouraged is conformity to an expected standard. And for Christians in Smyrna, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ made conformity a non-option since it would have involved the denial of their faith in their Lord and their Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you say, you know, there's worse things than poverty. I mean, why, why is Jesus mentioning poverty? But in this case, what Jesus actually says to them is, you're not as poor as you seem. What the church lacked in finances, and more than made up for in its faithful adherence to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the greatest treasure of all. That's what the people of Smyrna said in things that they wrote. Our faith in Christ is the greatest treasure of all. And so I ask you, how do you today view your relationship with Christ? Is it the greatest treasure of all? Would you be willing to die for your faith? Christ said, I know your poverty, but you are rich. Although the gospel may not feed a couple's hungry children, it is worth more than all the gold in the world. It has the power to uphold and strengthen God's people through the worst persecutions and sufferings. I really have to think about my faithfulness. I don't know about you. I do all this studying. I get prepared for a sermon. And it starts to speak to my heart and to my mind. How faithful am I really? How many little petty things do I complain about to the Lord when I ought to be filled with the joy of my salvation? History bears out the challenge to the faithful in Smyrna. There's actually, in the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, it was written by John Fox in 1563. He writes about a pastor from Smyrna in the second century. His name is Polycarp. And the story of Polycarp Carp, Carp, the pastor of Smyrna stands as one of the most prominent of all the stories he relates in that book. In fact, the church known by his name still stands today in Izmir. As pastor of the church in Smyrna, Polycarp was arrested as an old man by the Roman governor. As they were bringing him to the governor, they set him in a room and they said, you have one hour to pray because you face the death penalty. For your faith. His accusers began to feel sorry for him because this was a very generous and kind and gracious man. And so the, even his enemies began to plead with him, what harm, what harm would it be, Polycarp, to say, Lord Caesar, and the sacrifice to the emperors, and to save yourself? Polycarp was silent. The hour ticked by. They kept pressuring him to compromise. He said, I will not do as you advise me. So the governor of the province responded, all you have to do is worship Caesar as Lord, and I will release you immediately. Polycarp said, for 86 years, I have served Jesus, and he has never wronged me. How shall I blaspheme my king who saved me? And the pro-council was angered by these words and said to Polycarp, I will tame you with fire. Polycarp calmly replied, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is soon extinguished. But the fire of future judgment and of eternal judgment reserved for the ungodly, of which you are ignorant, why do you delay? Do whatever pleases you. And the pagans and the Jews of Smyrna, and it, it talks about Jews who were not true Jews in the text, shouted unanimously that he should be burned alive. 
Polycarp's words were, O Father, I bless you that you counted me worthy to receive my portion among the number of martyrs. And when he said amen, they lit the fire. Now it says in the account that a wind came up and blew the fires away from Polycarp. But a Roman centurion who was standing there got very frustrated that Polycarp hadn't caught on fire, so he took his spear and he stuck it in the side of Polycarp. Jesus said to the angel at Smyrna, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. The message to the church at Smyrna, I think, had to have comforted Polycarp. The one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now there's a whole bunch of symbolism uh, throughout uh, this, this piece. And I think the second death is one. We've talked about it on one of the Friday classes, but I'll tell you this. You thought there was only one death. <laughs> There's actually two. But as Christians, as it says here, you don't have to go through the second death. You go through the first death. The first death is when you give your life to Jesus Christ. What's the scripture say? You die to yourself, and then ultimately at the end of your life, you die. You go to be with the Lord in heaven. It's not the finalized place as of yet, because there's a second death. In that second death, the ungodly are judged, and it's spoken of in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. But the second death is more permanent. It's the decision of whether you're going to spend time with God forever or without God forever. And Christians who have given of themselves to God and to Christ in this life do not go through the second death because it's already been decided for us. It is ironic that the death of Christians such as Polycarp has fueled the growth of Christianity. It is not the persecution that fuels the gospel, but like Polycarp's bold response to be faithful unto death, that bold response in the presence of persecution, and the grace under pressure is what inspires faithfulness in others. See, there are still those today who are slandered and afflicted. The majority of Christian martyrs today, none of us even know their names. Their faithfulness to Jesus Christ did not make them famous, but Jesus Christ knows each and every one. The challenge to be faithful to the point of death remains. It calls us to be faithful even in the midst of our own difficulties and sufferings, which are far less than what took place at Smyrna. Trials and persecutions in life are never easy. We all face them, each and every one of us. Sometimes, actually, our perception of the difficulty is more of a problem than the trial themselves. The persecutors of the church at Smyrna wanted that church to think that it was poor, when really it had the greatest wealth of all. They also wanted it to think that it was weak, that it could easily be destroyed by the sword, but the Lord turns all of this around in verse 10 when he says that persecution really serves a different purpose. It brings unity amongst God's people, and it brings faithfulness to God. So the Lord said, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It's symbolic once again. A lot of times at a celebration of life service, we say that the person who has just died and was transformed from this world to the next has received the crown of life. I think there's some truth to that. Other places in Scripture say that you don't get the crown of life until the Lord's second coming. And in the letter that's coming up to the church of Philadelphia, it says don't do anything that would cause you to lose the crown of life. And what that tells me is that you, as Christians today, possess the crown of life already because you have overcome sin. The crown of life says that we have overcome sin in this life. At our death, it says we overcome death. And in the future, it tells us that we will be with God forever and ever. That is the reward of the faithful. So our predecessors in the Christian walk met the challenge. They received the reward, the crown of life. They were crowned with the victor's crown. They were overcomers. You and I are faithful today. How are we going to show that faithfulness? 
one of the things that it really convicts my heart and mind about is stop complaining. Stop bemoaning. Recognize and show the world that Christ is with you 24-7 in the good times and in the bad times. And let us be a faithful witness to each and every person with whom we come in contact. The challenge is to be faithful. It means we follow Christ no matter what the cost. So to the faithful Christians, there will always be awaiting spiritual riches. Amen and amen.